Great. Well, thank you. Welcome to the New America Foundation. Uh, my name is Peter Bergen. I'm a senior fellow here. Um, very happy to have <clears throat> our two guests today uh, talking about this book, The Only Thing Worth Dying For, an excellent account of uh, the first several weeks of the war in Afghanistan and the account of taking uh, then uh, a Pashtun leader by the name of Hamid Karzai into southern Afghanistan, uh, being there as he became uh, the interim president of the country, uh, being there as uh, he was nearly killed by an American bomb. Um, and Eric Belem uh, is the author of the book, and uh, Major Amarine uh, to his right is the uh, principal uh, uh, actor in the book, as it were, or principal character. Uh, and uh, it's really a great pleasure to have them both here. And so Jason is going to speak first, Major Amarine, and second, Eric. Uh, and then we'll open it to Q&A. If you could identify yourself, um, uh, we have C-SPAN, and so we'd also like to make sure that the question is uh, gotten by the other mic. Uh, so, Jason. Good morning. Uh, it's a privilege to have the opportunity to, uh, to speak to you today. I'd like to emphasize up front that I'm not an Afghanistan expert. Uh, when I first told this story uh, nearly nine years ago, it was for the sole purpose of honoring the men who died fighting beside me in Afghanistan, uh, and it's why I'm here today. Uh, in 2001, I was a detachment commander in the 5th Special Forces Group. The uh, specialty of all Green Berets is unconventional warfare and my men were uh, among the best at their trade. My team spent most of 2001 in Kazakhstan uh, training the Kazakhs to fight the Islamic movement of Uzbekistan. The attacks uh, in New York and Washington came at the end of our training of the Kazakhs. As we watched the BBC uh, coverage of the burning towers, we were all quite certain that uh, we'd be invading Afghanistan soon. As such, my, my team uh, returned to the U.S. and we joined the rest of the 5th Group uh, as it was prepared uh, to deploy to Uzbekistan in preparation for the actual invasion of Afghanistan. Uh, my second-in-command, Master Sergeant uh, Jefferson Davis, he'd been uh, in Somalia, he'd been in Iraq, uh, and he'd seen 5th Group spin up for war. So uh, he worked hard to make sure that while we're getting the team ready for the deployment, ready for war. We also uh, got them home to see their families because uh, we frankly didn't expect everyone to make it back. The most obvious strategy for Afghanistan at the time was one that we pursued, infiltrate Special Forces A teams to link up with the Northern Alliance to defeat the Taliban. The CIA facilitated our team's uh, link ups of the Northern Alliance leadership. The first teams into the country helped to uh, coordinate and support Northern Alliance operations against the Taliban. My team's mission, uh, in contrast, appeared to be little more than harassment initially. Uh, my men were to open up the South. Uh, we're going to uh, link up with a Pashtun warlord who hoped to stir up trouble in the Pashtun tribal belt. That Pashtun, named Abdul Haq, was captured and killed shortly after my team began preparing for that mission. Uh, with the Northern Alliance gaining momentum, it really seemed absurdly dangerous to continue to seek opportunities in the Pashtun tribal belt, given the fact that we're likely going to seize it anyway with uh, Northern Alliance forces. Then a second Pashtun sought support. Uh, his name was Hamid Karzai. My team was sent to link up with him to determine if he was credible enough to support if the mission was worth the risk. Over the course of a week of debriefing him and learning his intentions, uh, we decided that the mission indeed was was worth the risk it posed uh, going into the Taliban-controlled South. My team worked with Karzai uh, to develop a number of objectives. Uh, and for the most part in this order, uh, we're going to keep the Northern Alliance forces in the north, uh, build a Pashtun guerrilla army uh, effectively from scratch under Karzai's command, uh, seize the town of Tarankot in order to gain control of Uruzgan, then we'd build a larger Pashtun army and seize Kandahar as a final coup de grace against the Taliban. It all really hinged on Karzai's belief that the Pashtun were ready to rise up against the Taliban leadership. 
Uh, we believe that if we failed, there would likely be a, another civil war as the Northern Alliance came into the Pashtun tribal belt uh, and all the bloodshed followed from that. Uh, my team infiltrated Afghanistan uh, twice in November. First, it was to uh, dispatch uh, Karzai subordinate commanders to gather men. Uh, and then we uh, infiltrated a link up with Karzai and his uh, subordinates to start the campaign. 72 hours after our infiltration, uh, we seized Tarankot and defeated a large Taliban force composed of Pakistani Taliban. Although, to be honest, in uh, 2001, we weren't really that nuanced. It, it was really more uh, trivia to us at the time that, oh, okay, these are Taliban from Pakistan. Uh, you know, obviously our sophistication has increased quite a bit in terms of how we view the Taliban today. Uh, we seized Tarankot, and it, it really was uh, the big victory that Karzai sought. Uh, I mean, it, it was symbolically just uh, crushing for the Taliban. We, we'd started this campaign in their backyard, and we seized control of Tarankot, and very quickly Uru's gone. A general uprising in the Pashtun tribal belt followed uh, as we gained control of Uruzgan and prepared to move on to other parts of the, uh, uh, of the Pashtun tribal belt. Uh, on December 4th, actually let me back up and uh, I'll say this, our, our advances uh, outpaced our ability to grow an army. Uh, a tribal leader named Bari Ghul uh, brought 30 men who linked up with my team, and uh, we sort of became one family. Uh, there were about you know, 40, 45 of us, and uh, we became the uh, core of our uh, of our nascent force. Uh, adding more and more troops uh, that joined the cause, we fought our way to the outskirts of Kandahar, uh, ultimately outside of Kandahar with about 300 men, while Kandahar itself had hundreds or thousands of Taliban. Uh, but fortunately, the Taliban perceived that we had a much bigger force than we did, and we're happy to uh, let them go on believing that. Uh, on December 4th, we learned that Hamid, Kar Hamid Karzai was to be selected the interim leader of the country. Uh, we'd heard rumblings about this for several days, but it, it still was uh, a surreal moment. Uh, you know, the, the campaign began... First, it was just let's stir up some trouble in the, the uh, Taliban south. Uh, then it evolved into attempting to prevent a civil war between the or northern ethnic groups and the Pashtun. And then here at the end, we'd suddenly been uh, part of uh, helping to bring a, a leader to power. Uh, it was definitely a poignant moment. The other news that night was that the Taliban were to uh, uh, surrender to us the next day in Shawalikot. Uh, Karzai had been certain this would happen. He didn't believe that we'd actually have to uh, fight for Kandahar. He felt that once we got to the outskirts of the city, it, it would be enough to uh, force their hand and they would, uh, they, they would capitulate. Uh, my combo sergeant, Dan Peditori, uh, had joked that he hoped the Taliban uh, that, that were coming to surrender to us didn't actually realize how few forces we had because they might change their mind. Uh, Though we had no further contact with the enemy uh, that night and didn't expect it the next day, uh, we, we at that point really expected that our mission would uh, swap from being insurgents to counterinsurgents in the days to come. The next morning on December 5th, the battalion headquarters arrived and began directing airstrikes against suspected enemy positions across the river from us. During one of those airstrikes, they uh, inadvertently dropped a bomb on themselves uh, and they were co-located with us on the same hill, so we were all hit. The casualties were catastrophic. Uh, Jefferson Davis, Dan Pettitore, Barry Gould, and most of his men were killed. Uh, all of my team was wounded. We estimate that we lost about uh, 50 of our men that day. We'll, we'll never really know for certain. Uh, nearly half our army right there outside of Kandahar was, uh, was killed or wounded in the airstrike. Uh, and the villagers buried uh, the, the torn flesh and uh, remains of our Afghans and Americans, the un unidentifiable remains uh, together by sunset in the Muslim tradition. Uh, it, it was a uh, horrible way for it to end. Uh, really, in the aftermath of that, the Taliban came to surrender and Karzai went on to lead the country. 
Eric Blem uh, spent several years interviewing uh, us, uh, interviewing planners and policymakers, uh, thatching together all of our perspectives on the campaign. Uh, I tell you that the team itself, we, we rarely uh, really spoke about what went on. Uh, and, it, and it was important us to have a full account of what occurred as uh, we ourselves try to assess uh, you know, the, the events of that month and uh, you know, what, what our friends died doing. Uh, with that, I turn you over to Eric Blem. Thanks, Jason. Good afternoon. And I just wanted to, first of all, thank the New America Foundation and Peter Bergen for reading my book and inviting me. Uh, I'm really honored to be here. And you know, the, the New American Foundation stands for new ideas, um, looking at this fast-paced world that we live in, the wars that we're reporting so quickly on blogs and things that you read tomorrow, this morning and this afternoon, it's already off of your radar. And that really ties in closely with this book because what I wanted to do was to take a look at this one mission and truly pause and reflect and to study it. Because, first of all, at the time, the team didn't recognize or didn't realize the significance of what their mission represented. And it truly went off the radar of, of the American public and the world public after the Friendly Fire incident. So. That's what the book's all about, and I have to say up front as well that it's it's not an analysis of the war, it's not a pro-war book, it's not an anti-war book, it's truly a, a book told from the perspective of the men on the ground, the early planners from two hours after the Twin Towers fell in a, a, a bunker at Sox Center at Mac, MacDill Air Force Base in Florida, all the way to the moment and the aftermath of that bomb that hit their position. It, it seems in, in these talks, people usually want to know why, how, how you came to this story. Um, my, my background, I, I came from being an editor at a snowboarding magazine and, and outdoors, adventure, tra travel. My last book was about a, a backcountry ranger, a pacifist, who worked in the High Sierra Mountains and disappeared mysteriously. So how do you go from that to covering a, a team of Green Berets in Afghanistan? I, I grew up with a great respect for our armed forces, and my mother used to take out a, a cigar box when I was young that had mementos from World War II, uh, safety pins that they'd used to pin up the blankets over their windows in the blackouts in L.A., uh, the seed packages from their victory gardens, uh, ration books. As a kid, I couldn't even fathom the idea of rationing sugar or flour, and articles and magazine articles that spanned the Pearl Harbor attacks all the way through the, the bombing at Hiroshima. So I, you know, that was considered our greatest generation. And not too many years ago, people started to realize that those stories were dying with the veterans of that war. And after 9-11, I, like many of us, had that question, what can I do? And as a writer, I decided I really wanted to cover something to document the men and or women who fight this war. And I did what any writer does, I, I talked to my agent. And I asked, I said, you know, this is something I would really like to do. And, you know, keep your ears open. I really don't care what it is. I just want to do something. Well, as fate would have it, she knew a friend who knew the sister of a soldier who was with the team that worked with Hamid Karzai in 2001. And I immediately thought, oh, I remember that name. It had been five years earlier, 2005. And I did a Google search and started looking around and checking it out, and I realized that there really wasn't much to the story that had been reported. I mean, there was very little uh, concrete facts or anything, and of course it was something you think would be buried in the bowels of the, of the CIA forever. But what I did is uh, I found out that one soldier, Captain Jason Amarine, Major Jason Amarine now, worked at West Point, and so I called the public affairs department there and asked if I could sit in on one of his classes. And I sat in on the class, and I told him that I was interested in covering something on the, in the Afghan war, and that I was interested in his particular mission. And he kindly walked around the, you know, the fortress-like grounds of, of West Point, telling me the stories, giving me the significance of the different uh, plaques on the walls and the statues. And he told me at the end of that visit that I'd like to tell the story, but the extent that I'm going to tell you the story, and the extent that I believe my men would tell you, it kind of depends if you have the family behind you who, of the men who did not come home. And so what I did is I 
I went to a little town in Cheshire, Massachusetts, where, you know, the classic little American town where the tallest building is the church steeple. And I met the family. Uh, they insisted that they pick me up at the airport, even though I was flying about an hour away from their home, and I arrived about 11.30 at night. And the first thing we did when we got back to their house, thankfully, because you can imagine, I'm meeting the family of this son who passed away immediately walking the house, and you can tell it's a shrine to his memory. You have the medals, you have the articles up, the pictures. And the father reached into a cupboard and pulled out a bottle of Knob Creek whiskey and a can of American beer. And we started talking, and she, they told me the stories of their son. And they told me what they had heard from his teammates. And by the end of that weekend, after visiting his grave, after walking on the trails around his house where he played as a boy, after seeing the American flag out front that the mother said every day he was gone when he was deployed for the war, she would fix the flag, she would straighten it up, and it was kind of like, she said, fixing his collar on the way out to school. She said she could never pass a flag without thinking of, of him. Well, at the end of the, of the weekend, the father told me, Eric, you're going to do a great job. We can tell that already. But what I want you to do is tell the story like it happened. Don't glamorize what happened. Don't over-dramatize it, because the men, his men, his son's teammates had told him that it had happened in some articles. He said, tell the good, the bad, the ugly, tell it like it happened. That's how you can best honor my son and their mission and set it straight for history. And so that moment was really when the, this story became a calling for me and, and a quest to really get to all aspects of the story, which kind of leads me to the, how Jason ended off, you know, the different perspectives. I made an effort at that point to try and dissect, really, the entire mission, all the way from the moment the planning began, which at first, the, the whole invasion of Afghanistan was set to be a conventional attack, you know, bombing followed by what one planner said, the Soviet experiment, which obviously didn't work. And I found a lot of interesting things out about the planning process. One thing is that a lot of it came from the ground up, you know, the subordinates that are bringing up these ideas to the higher command. And at the end of the day, I was able to talk to individuals who would then open the door to the next individual and the next individual. And I was able to talk to the majority of the surviving members of the team, uh, the headquarters that came in with them, uh, the airmen and the air crews of the rescue mission who came and rescued them and saved many lives on December 5th. And from that, you get a full picture of this mission. Overwhelmed, um, over, over, overlying the whole thing was these men and their perception and their interaction with Karzai, who at, by then I heard only really two things about Karzai. One, that he, well, it was starting to, in 2005, that he was corrupt. Two, we put him to pow into power. We installed him. And three, that he's a warlord. And throughout the process of the book and talking with the men who were closest with them in 2001, I, I couldn't have got a different picture. I mean, he was, he was a person who was, uh, was mentored. His driving forces in life were Mahatma Gandhi, Nel, um, Nelson Mandela, Martin Luther King. And the farthest you could imagine from what the American public or even these guys thought when they perceived him to be a warlord. So a lot, of, a lot of things came out that really surprised me, and I think the biggest thing is what happened in such a short span of time. From the period of time that this team met Hamid Karzai, when he was a virtual unknown on the world scene, they planned their insurgency in about a week. They infiltrated southern Afghanistan. Three weeks later, every single member of that team in the course of that time had been either wounded or was killed, not all in just that one accident. And Hamid Karzai was, on that very day, chosen to be the interim leader of Afghanistan. From obscurity, all that death and, and rise to power in three weeks. And that's really the bookends of my story. And it's, it's an amazing story. And I, I do want to clarify one thing. When I flew across country, I'm, I'm from California, San Diego, and I, other than dusting off my jacket on the way here, it was kind of a... a no problem. The 
I stopped off in Knoxville, Tennessee to another family of one of the men who didn't come home and, and hand delivered a copy of the book to this family. And the mother held the book and she was just so proud of it. And she, she told me, you know, not all the people, and she knew that day, how many know this, but 962 people have died in Afghanistan. She rattled that off off the top of her tongue. She checked it every day. And she said, not everybody has someone like you to look for these stories and to tell these stories. And every one of them is worth telling. This obviously means a lot to me, but she said, if you can just urge your colleagues to seek out these stories, because they're all very important. They all have a, a place in history, and you never know what the significance is, perhaps until years later. Thank you. Great. Well, thank you very much to, uh, to Major Hammerine and also to Eric Blem. Um, before we throw it over to questions, I had a quick Two questions for Major Amarine. One, uh, were you there when Karzai called the Bonn conference? And he, I mean, he, he, he describes a call that he made in the middle of the conference, which he says was sort of what put him over the top, perhaps, as the, as the interim leader. Right. I, I actually was uh, out on a patrol when, when that call came. Uh, he'd mentioned it, and it, it was, uh, you know, our, our focus was so much on the fight that something like that was. Um, almost amusing by comparison. You know, we're, we're focused on the Taliban. We're focused on, are we going to get overrun? Uh, and Hamid said, oh, by the way, I need to call into this conference. You know, you, you might want to come by. And, and I was like, okay, yeah, I'll see if I can make it. it you know, it, it, was, uh, it, it was kind of ironic that way. And then I got tied up in other things. And uh, it's one of those moments you look back on. It's like, you know, I could have gone on that patrol a bit later. So, uh, yeah, I missed it. I, I, was, I was out. Did he tell you, uh, I mean, did, were you aware of the significance of this Bonn conference or was this something that yeah, was... Sort of yeah, yeah, I mean, it, it, uh, it everything happened, it, it, it was sort of a, uh, well, really, it took off fast. I mean, you know, we're on the ground 72 hours and uh, we're, we're, you know, fighting for our survival in Tarancote. Uh and we'd expected the first fight to take weeks or months before we'd be ready for it. Uh, but the, uh, the Afghans sort of dictated the schedule, and they rose up, and we needed to help them. Uh, and so from there, within a couple of, you know, within a couple of weeks, as, as Eric had said, uh, you know, we're, we're hearing all the, all, all the uh, stories from uh, Karzai himself, where all the indicators are people are looking at him uh, to be some part of the new government. I mean, it, it really wasn't until uh, uh, probably right around December 1st that um, – that I, I realized, wait, he might actually be leading this country. Mm -hmm. uh, Dan Pettitore uh, uh, had, had actually caught on probably a week sooner. Um, Karzai had written a note. Um, normally I, I would just sit there uh, uh, beside him during the day, and then as we, as we were uh, directing airstrikes, I'd run, do what I needed to do, and come back. So during some of the airstrikes, Karzai had written a note saying, you know, hey, uh, Please don't engage this convoy coming from De Rau. They're friendly. And I get the note. I look at it, and it, it was a very politely, nicely written note not to accidentally kill these people. And I was sort of, you know, I, I was kind of amused by the moment because this is deadly serious business, and here's a very politely written note asking me, please, not to engage the convoy. And, uh, and I'm, you know, so I, I toss it in the burn bag where we got rid of all of our uh, uh, secret paperwork. We'd burn it. And Dan reaches into the bag. He's like, can I keep this? I'm like, why? He's like, you don't understand. He's going to be leading this country someday. And I'm like, uh, okay, Dan. Anyway, let's get back to what we were doing. So it, 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 was, uh, it, it was funny how that developed because for me, even, even when all this was going on, I was aware of it. Uh, I'd be sitting there when, when a lot of these conversations were going on, and I, I'd be listening and nodding. But I, I was so, uh, so focused on Kandahar and the Taliban leadership that, uh, you know, it, 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 it was something that I, I just didn't devote a lot of time to, if that makes sense. With the, uh, the Battle of Tarancourt, which, of course, Eric writes about in the book and you were there, I mean, it, it, there was a moment um, when it seemed like the battle uh, could go the other way. Mm -hmm. Did you want to perhaps elaborate a little? Well, with uh, our, our plan, you know, the best laid plans and all that, uh, was to 
you know, build an army of several hundred. I mean, I, I hope that we could get about 500 uh, men together and, and make that sort of the core of our army. Uh, and instead, 72 hours after we arrive, uh, Tarancote's risen up, and we have about 30 guerrillas and uh, the nine guys on my team, because I'd had to leave two behind because of weight restrictions on the aircraft. So uh, our team is uh, sitting there looking at the situation. Uh, uh, Tarancote was very important to the Taliban. Uh, Mullah Omar's hometown wasn't far from there. And we anticipated potentially thousands of Taliban uh, coming to retake the town after the locals rose up and invited us to come in. So, I mean, we, we really had to take a hard look. Uh, there, there were you know, less than 40 of us, and we expected it to be a pretty ugly fight. Uh, but there's no question that we had to try to help. The Taliban uh, were, were brutal, uh, and the Taliban were going to uh, uh, you know, definitely seek revenge against the town for hanging the Taliban leader there. So uh, we, we came up with the best plan we could, which was uh, pretty much sit outside of town, call in airstrikes, and uh, hope that scared the Taliban away. Uh, the battle went back and forth. Uh, our, our guerrillas initially ran away, and all we could do is go with them because we ourselves didn't have any transportation. Uh, when we got back into Tarancote, I mean, it, it really it was, uh, okay, what are we going to do now? So uh, we stole their trucks and drove back out with the nine of us and kept calling in the, uh, the airstrikes. But what was amazing was uh, the people of Tarancote came out to join us, not the, uh, the, the warrior class, you know, not, not future guerrillas. The townspeople themselves came out and joined us. So uh, as we continue to engage the Taliban with aircraft, the townspeople sort of uh, manned the barricades uh, around town and helped to fight off the Taliban when they would get close. So in the end, uh, you know, Tarancote, uh, you know, stood up for itself uh, and, and helped us to fight off the Taliban. And I, I think on the one hand what we learned from that was that uh, our, our guerrillas were going to need some training. Uh, you know, it, that, that was definitely going to be a challenge. But on the other hand, uh, what Karzai had been telling us that, you know, it, it, it first seemed like a nice notion, but we weren't sure if it was true, was the people really were rising up against the Taliban. You know, we didn't know if that, that was really going to happen, but when things were at their grimmest in Tarancote, the people helped. Uh, and, and that really uh, uh, gave us the momentum to sweep the, uh, the Pashtun tribal belt. And also, as a result of this victory, the Northern Alliance started calling Karzai. Uh, I mean, it, it really helped his credibility quite a bit. When the uh, yours was a special fifth special forces group, you were then pulled out to go to potentially to the war in Iraq. Is that right? Well, my my team itself, uh, we were all medic medically evacuated on December fifth. Uh, one of my men uh, was shot uh, the day before when we were attacking a hill, and he was already medevaced out. Uh, and then the rest of us were hit by the bombing on December fifth. So uh, uh, all of us were. Uh, we, we, we'd already left the theater and were recovering from our injuries. And then the rest of the fifth group followed us shortly thereafter and began to prepare for the invasion. Great. Well, um, we'll throw it open to questions. Um, please identify yourself and please wait for the mic. Marvin Weinbaum. Uh, Marvin Weinbaum, the Middle East Institute. A couple of questions. Uh, it's. Uh, let me put it this Most of us uh, looked at Karzai at that point as, uh, as having failed. Uh, and you haven't mentioned this in your narrative, and I wondered why. Uh, and it was the story about his going into Erzagan, and we're having to extricate him, uh, that the, in fact, the, uh, the people who he expected uh, to fall behind him had uh, double-crossed him. Uh, that's one story I wish you you comment on that. On that. Uh, the other is I, I'm getting uh, the impression that uh, again this is was the, uh, the the feeling at the time that really what was decisive at this point it certainly wasn't number of forces, but what was decisive was the psychological effect of the bombing you're talking about. That this was uh, uh, as much as anything is what convinced them uh, that they couldn't stand up, and then you found the familiar pattern of the Afghans knowing which way the wind's blowing. And as much as wherever their sympathies were, they, they saw now that uh, they were likely going to be on the losing side if they stayed in, uh, loyal to the Taliban. 
the the first part of the question again <laughs> if you could repeat just the very uh, the, just about the uh, uh, his initial this is after Abul Haq uh, I guess was already right. killed the, that, uh, and then he goes in to Aruzagan right I can, uh, I can cover and, that and yeah I well that is covered in the book um, and it goes from that moment forward and explains the gist of why he was pulled out and again there's that idea that okay well Abdul Haq was pulled out. He's the only other Pashtun at this time that has gone into the South. He was assassinated, or not assassinated, but he was captured and, and killed. And from that point, there was speculation, of course, uh, as to was the reasoning they pulled out Hamid Karzai so quickly because they didn't want another black eye because Abdul Haq had been the only other Pashtun that had gone in, and neither of them had been offered meaningful support before that. They'd only been offered cell phones. They didn't. It was considered too dangerous to go in with um, any Americans on the ground at that point. It was until they realized, I think, the significance that they needed a Pashtun in this whole equation because so many people were coming south with the Northern Alliance. The Americans, we were, we were supporting the Northern Alliance just as much as we were in Hamid Karzai. And that's when they started realizing that there had to be a Pashtun representative in this post-Taliban government. And again, I cover that in, in the book, kind of the nuances of all that. So it is, it is covered. Does that answer your question? Well, the story. I mean, the story is accurate. Let, let me, let did, me uh, did, add to that. He did fail initially. Uh, well, it, yeah, let, let me, let okay, me speak to that. Saying. Because uh, uh, when, when they withdrew, uh, it was uh, after having contact with the Taliban. They, they were in a firefight with the Taliban. And uh, Bari Ghul, who was uh, a, a younger tribal leader and a uh, great military leader, uh, he actually fought them off and was angry that they withdrew. Uh, so, you know, th this is something that, um, you know, I, I I couldn't tell you what all of them were thinking, but Bari Ghul believed that they could fight the Taliban off and keep on going with their mission to raise, uh, uh, you know, basically to raise a force in the area. So it, it's kind of an interesting thing because you, you talk to Bari Ghul, I mean, he's dead now, he died on the 5th, but talking to him after the event, he was actually really mad that, uh, that uh, they, they had withdrawn because he felt that, uh, that they were doing just fine. So, uh, you know, it was definitely a precautionary measure, uh, and I, I think that it was a good thing that, that they did withdraw so we could work with them and develop some kind of a plan, even if the plan sort of went out the window, at least we were there to help. Uh, but as I say, if you talk to the folks who were actually fighting in that confrontation, uh, they actually are feeling pretty good about running the Taliban off. Did you, the, the second part of your question, about the bombing, uh, did, the, did you mean the friendly fire bombing or no, the, I mean that the Battle the of Tarancote? very massive, the use of very heavy ordnance, for example, apparently had, uh, I'm, I'm told, had a, had a devastating uh, effect here uh, in terms of the fact that uh, the, or the kinds of methods that they had been fighting, the, the means of fighting, this was not going to work, uh, that they had no answer to this kind of bombardment. The Taliban. The, the Taliban, yes. Yeah, it was definitely a, and part of their whole original plan was for this to be a demoralizing blow to hit right in the heartland of, of the Taliban in Erzgan. And word spread, I mean, it, it, the, the idea of rumor in the, in the tribal belt was just so strong where you read, read the articles back at the time and you see how they, the, the articles that were printed up were saying there were thousands of people fighting alongside Karzai on the road to Kandahar from Tarankot and his own brother reported um, at least 800 men were alongside him and, you know, and so I was able to, knowing the dates and what was actually going on, I was able to piece it together to show what was um, myth and what was reality. What the Taliban knew was that they sent a thousand men, fifty vehicles, and they were almost all destroyed. And so that equated to Karzai's support in the tribal belt, and it, it, it branched out to the neighboring villages. And so I would say absolutely, that was a turning point in, in the war. That was at a point when the Northern Alliance actually called and congratulated Karzai at that point. At that time, the U.S. envoy, I kind of, I, I phase away from the, the men on the ground occasionally to give context of what's going on with the Bonn Conference and this and that. Uh, the, and the U.S. envoy to the Afghan resistance was trying to get the Northern Alliance to speak with you know, the, the Rome group at that time, and not without success. 
why does the Northern Alliance have to talk? You know, they're winning, they're ruling half the country now. They have the U.S. support behind them. What's the incentive? All these emigre leaders that are trying to come in. Well, now all of a sudden, Karzai was on the ground. He did have some credibility as a warrior, where before he was had great credibility as a diplomat, and he was well known in the area and liked in the surrounding region. But he had no credibility on the ground. He was our chief. Correct. So, but he, what he did lack was again a, among the Northern Alliance, he lacked that credibility, like he's fighting on the ground. And after this battle, word spread, and that was truly the tipping point that started giving Karzai the credibility where the Northern Alliance considered him as mighty as, or actually the Taliban considered him as mighty as some of the Northern Alliance generals. Uh, Jim Green with the Disabled American Veterans. As a writer, with with uh, your apparently no military background, was that a help or a hindrance in writing your book? In telling a story, I think it's, you know, you need to know your subject. I, I've read military writing since, you know, I was 10 years old reading the Battle of Midway and all the way up through World War II, Vietnam, Korean War stories. And so I knew the basics of it, but I wanted this story to be very reachable to the general public, you know. And so a lot of the questions that I have are questions that I know the reader would have. So I really was able to try and... Um, try and put it into a language that would be understood and in a story. I tried to keep the reader in the moment with the men. Um, everything in the book, everything that you see as far as a quote, an inner thought, a description, everything came directly from recorded interviews with the men. The few, very few citations in the book are only from places where I use context uh, to say perhaps what was going on in the White House Situation Room when this team was doing this. And other than that, everything that you read about it on the ground is from them. And so. To stay true and pure to their story in that period of time, it was really pretty simple. I added some ground rules, and it was to tell it like the men tell me. Okay. Hi, my name is Tara McKelvey. I'm writing for Boston Review. And I have a question. You said the, fi the family of one of the uh, men who died said, tell the story the way it was. Yes. Um, what were some of the problems that that brought, you know, like what were some of the things that you found it hard to tell? And also I'm curious, as a subject in the book, were there things that you saw that he, you wished he hadn't told, or you know, how did that play itself out? Uh, I have no regrets as far as what I, what has been printed. I stand behind everything in the book. Uh, as far as problems, I mean, I did come up, up, up across things that were horrific. You know, things that you don't want a, a mother and father to hear about what might have occurred to their son. And in that way, I had to choose, you know, respect. I had to just choose common respect. Um, at the same time, I wanted to be accurate. If there were mistakes made, they made it very clear that they wanted to hear about it, whether it was their son or not. They considered him a professional soldier. He understood the risks. He understood the risks of potential friendly fire. But at the same time, they really did want to know the truth of what happened, how it built up, how it occurred. And they just felt that if they knew that, it would be a healing process for them. And so I, that was really what, for me, just having that go-ahead from them made it a little bit easier because at the end of the day, they told me to tell it like it happened, and that was what I did. Eric, I, I, Eric did a lot of reporting on what, how the friendly fire incident actually happened. I think it would be useful if you could just maybe just give us a summary of how, you know, how did that actually happen because it was a very small human error which had very large consequences. Yeah, it will, well, again, I don't want to spoil it for right. the readers, but there... It's not really one instance, you know, depending on who you talk to, they might say this was this person's fault. Other people would think this person's fault. I mean, I uncovered rumors where there were people that were truly considering retribution upon certain individuals who were not involved to the extent that these rumors had spread, if that makes sense. Uh, at the end of the day, what I was able to do was piece together a virtual staircase of uh, stepping stones that led up to this friendly fire incident from decisions made just in um, not necessarily rules of engagement but command structure you know uh, technical aspects everything really did add up so there were a number of um, contributing factors to the accident and so I think in some ways it, it was surprising to me how many things added up to make that one small incident and again that one final incident I don't think is the answer to for blame. It's really who came first, the chicken or the egg. Um, 
Thank you. I'm, uh, I'm Leon Weintraub, a former member of the Foreign Service of the United States. I'd like to ask you if you, if you have the capabilities to go a little bit beyond the incident and uh, to see if you could shed some light on us for us as far as the allegations of narcotic smuggling. We've heard a lot of this about the Taliban, and in fact, we've also heard about this also from the Northern Alliance, our, our allies to a large degree. I'd like to know to what degree you feel these allegations that have been in the media for a number of years are accurate for either side, and how much does narcotics and, and the profits from them really do, do play a role in the support? Okay. Uh, I'll, I'll admit up front that it's really truly out of my area. I, I truly focused on this particular mission. I stayed in contact. I'm very well read in this situation and, and talked to a lot of people. There's no doubt that there is a narcotic situation in Afghanistan, but to the extent anything I'd be telling you right now, it wouldn't be fair because I, I really would be potentially misleading you. I don't know. Next. Hi, Laura E. I'm a freelance, and I'm just curious in terms of you described the uprising, I guess, within uh, the vill the town that actually you had arrived at the small force, expected to wait for a few months, and then instead there was this general uprising. Can you sort of describe what you mean by that? And then also you said villagers came or people came to man the barricades. Um, did they have their own weapons that they were able to hold people off, uh, hold the Taliban off? And can you sort of describe some of that as well? Okay. Um, I mean, to begin with, uh, our intent was to uh, infiltrate the country and uh, dispatch uh, Karzai's uh, subordinate leaders, his lieutenants, to gather uh, tribal fighters from their respective tribes, and then they would all meet us uh, in a guerrilla base. Uh, and, and from there, we'd equip them, organize them. Uh, and the original plan for taking Tarancote, Tarancote is in a big valley, uh, and I, I wanted to have enough troops that we could choke off that valley is the best way to put it. Uh, and as we analyzed it, uh, we believed that you know, maybe 500 w would be enough to do the job, uh, and it was something that uh, we figured we'd have time on the ground to you know, develop a more detailed plan. And instead what happened was we, we got on the ground, uh, 24 hours later, we, uh, we uh, had a bunch of weapons dropped. We call it lethal aid. Uh, so, you know, AK-47s, uh, machine guns, things like that. And uh, hundreds of, of uh, gorillas actually came out of the mountains, collected the weapons, and went home. Uh, and I, I can't say it was unexpected, but it, it definitely wasn't uh, a, a high point. Um, so as, as we watched them, you know, leaving, uh, you know, we, we did the analysis and we realized we, we don't have credibility here. Uh, they're, they're glad to take the guns, uh, but they're still waiting to see. And we, we're put in a, you know, a, a, a predicament where on the one hand we needed to somehow uh, earn credibility, but on the other hand we couldn't earn credibility without the fighters. So to get the fighters we needed credibility, but we weren't going to get, you know, anyway. Uh, the following day we found out about Tarancote's uprising and that uh, the, the people of Tarancote, and, and they'd actually been talking to Karzai about it for, uh, for probably about a week. They were saying, hey, we're ready to rise up. There, there really is no Taliban garrison here. We could take control of the town. And we'd warned Karzai, we're not ready yet. If you rise up and we have you know, no, no follow-on force to actually hold the area, they're going to get slaughtered. You know, why don't you keep them quiet for now? Uh, but they went ahead and rose up anyway. And at that point, as I said, I mean, there were about 40 of us. So uh, all, all we could do was our, our best, and so we, we went in and, and did what we could. Uh, as far as the, the locals, uh, they, they were armed. It, it seemed like everybody had a weapon of some kind. Some were, were uh, pretty old, you know, bolt-action rifles and, and such. Others had, uh, you know, much fancier AK-47s, uh, and they basically just showed up. You know, uh, there was a language barrier. None of us actually spoke 
any of the local dialects, so uh, we had to try to get by with uh, uh, broken Farsi or Russian. Uh, Arabic didn't really work all that well because uh, uh, it, it was a strange thing. Uh, I, I actually haven't talked to other people who encountered this since, but uh, the Pashtun we're with considered the Arabs our enemy, meaning Al-Qaeda, so they didn't want to speak the language of our enemy. I, I, so Arabic didn't do us any good, and that's what uh, most of us had a little little bit of uh, fluency in. Uh, so, I mean, we're, we're out there in the streets trying to, uh, trying to figure out what to do with these people, and initially we wanted to get them out of the way. Uh, we didn't know when the Taliban would get in sight and might start, uh, you know, just shooting into the crowds and stuff, and then we realized, well, maybe we could use them. So through uh, just a lot of sign language, we're able to get them to form some security around us, and then at other parts of the town, uh, people went out to the edge of the city. I mean, barricades I meant more metaphorically. I mean, the, you know, the, the, uh, the town has high walls everywhere, and uh, uh, the Taliban that made it through the airstrikes and got close, uh, we heard small arms fire, and, uh, you know, and it, initially for me it was, well, I, I think we're through. Because once Taliban got in a terror code, there was nothing more we could do. With the nine of us, we couldn't clear a town, and uh, I was not going to direct airstrikes into the town for obvious reasons. It, it just wasn't going to happen. Uh, so when I first started hearing small arms fire, you know, my team is going, okay, what's going on? And we realized, you know, our, our villagers were fighting back. And, uh, and in the end, uh, I mean, we did what we could to protect the village, and the village did what it could to protect us and themselves. Come back. Ian Wilkie, I'm a consultant with Archer Analytics. Question for Major Amrine. In light of the recent attack in Kabul, I think I read in Agence France Press or Reuters that these were quote unquote Afghan commandos who responded to the attacks. And I wondered if, uh, if U.S. Special Forces had any role in training these commandos and whether or not you, you view the attack as a, as a successful response to uh, a swarm attack that's becoming more and more common. Uh, the last part, when you say a success, you mean the uh, our response to it, or um, well, you, you could probably address some of it in terms of who is training their uh, their uh, the Afghan special forces, because you address that in the book. Yeah, the any of the any of the as you say, commander, the more elite groups that they're trying to put together in Afghanistan now are being trained by special forces. I don't know for certain if it would be 5th Special Forces group, because since Afghanistan and, and Iraq, um, even though the 5th group was the one who focused on that geographic part of the of the world, different groups from across the, the 7th group and uh, others are also, you know, they're cycling in. But any of the, any, any of the, those type of more elite groups in Afghanistan, from what my, from the people I've spoken with, have been trained by special forces, Amer American, and in some cases, um, the SAS and the, the, from the UK. Yeah, and I, as far as advisors on the ground there during the fight, I, I think it's going to be hard for them to answer that. Yeah, yeah I, I, I couldn't I, say for sure. Although, uh, but what what I what I can tell you is uh, uh, the the nature of our working relationship with the Afghans as a whole is that uh, we try to work closely with them. Uh, we have uh, military teams that uh, you know go out to the field with them and uh, provide uh, professional expertise, uh, as well as uh, allow for uh, sort of real-time situational awareness through the coalition forces there. So I, I couldn't say for sure who is involved in that particular uh, counterattack, but uh, I, I can say that we actually do have a very close working relationship with them. That isn't to say that. Uh, the Afghan forces are are going to, uh, uh, you know, be you know fully mission capable overnight. It, it requires uh, months and years of of working with them, and also to understand, uh, you know, the, their you know, respective techniques and tactics and procedures that they themselves want to develop as a force. We're not trying to create a clone of our army. We're trying to find a way to. Uh, provide them with training and expertise as they develop it in themselves. Come back. Yeah, Chia uh, Chen, freelance correspondent. Uh, do you know what the status of the village or area you operate in? And uh, uh, does uh, uh, Green Beret 
very always use uh, uh, work, operate in the, behind the enemy line. And behind the enemy line, you have a, always have a problem of the supply, overrun, and uh, this communication. Uh, how's those things improve now? Thank you. Thank you. Um, well, what, one, uh, one thing, uh, Terran code itself is considered uh, a, a major, uh, uh, what's a good way to put it? We, we definitely, what's that? Town, I think. Yeah, it, it's considered extremely important for us to hold on to. I mean, really, Tarancote and Kandahar are, are two extremely important uh, towns in the south because of uh, uh, their strategic nature as part of the Pashtun tribal belt. So you'll read a lot of, uh, a lot of accounts of the various forces uh, that are operating, especially in Tarancote, because it's still a pretty austere area. Uh, so Tarancote, they're, they're uh, constantly uh, lots of forces out there, uh, you know, trying to hold on to the area uh, and really maintain what we started back in 2001. Uh, the area between Tarancote and Kandahar uh, is pretty hairy in a lot of places. Uh, Shwalikot, where uh, where the campaign ended for my men, uh, has seen a, a, a lot of fights, a, a lot of firefights, a lot of casualties. Uh, so it, it's been uh, it, it's been kind of a it's a strange feeling to see all these areas that uh, we felt we controlled in 2001, and to see how it's gone back and forth over the years. Uh, but uh, as I, I sort of would have expected anyway, a lot of these areas, uh, as we uh, expand our, our uh, troop deployments and such, a lot of those areas are uh, uh, being targeted as areas to gain control of again. They are important to us uh, back in 2001. They're important to us today if we have the troops to put out on the ground. Uh, with regard to the second question, uh, I mean, Special Forces is uh, uh, our bread and butter is insurgency and guerrilla warfare. It's what we're created for. Uh, fighting behind enemy lines uh, is, is really just uh, you know, one, one of the assumptions in terms of, of how we're going to conduct operations. And it's why our teams are, de are designed the way they are. Small team of 12 people, communications package that can uh, literally call any place in the world for help if we get in trouble. Uh, two medics on the team who uh, uh, are, are second to none in terms of trauma management, and they're prepared to keep you alive for 72 hours uh, with some pretty egregious wounds. So uh, special forces teams are designed to operate in the worst of environments. Uh, but that being said, uh, we're also, uh, we, we also take a pretty austere approach to combat. I mean, we, we generally are, are uh, not covered in electronic gadgets because batteries go dead. I mean, we're really trying to live with the locals, uh, fight with the locals. My team, we didn't wear body armor or Kevlar because our guerrillas didn't. Uh, you know, it's interesting to look back on just that fact alone now when you see our troops in combat because they're, they're so well equipped today. It's just in 2001, uh, you know, our, our mindset was we're, we're going to wear what our guerrillas wear. I mean, we fought with M4s, which I always preferred over an AK-47 myself, but uh, but that aside, we... we pretty much live like they lived. One important thing is uh, avoid uh, a friendly fire. Well, I, I mean, I guess I could say a couple things about that. I mean, on the one hand, uh, friendly fire, fratricide, pick your term. Uh, a uh, terribly large number of friendly forces are killed in every conflict because of it. And it's not something that should be accepted, but it's something that you understand is part of the danger. And for that reason, uh, you know, situational awareness is so important. You know, talking to the locals, getting to know, uh, you know, who is enemy, who's not enemy, uh, figuring out where it's appropriate, not appropriate to apply combat force. I mean, th there are situations inevitably where, uh, where uh, friendly forces are going to be commingling with the enemy in such a way that it's very, very hard to deconflict your fight. It's very, very hard to uh, protect people. Uh, civilians were my biggest fear over there. Uh, I mean, just from, you know, a, a purely, 
you know, value standpoint, I was going to do everything in my power to protect the innocent. Uh, you know, from a, a practical standpoint, I mean, we needed the civilians on our side. So, I mean, I was extremely conservative in, in uh, using military force. And, uh, I mean, part of the reason I joined myself at the hip with Karzai was so he and I could talk over every airstrike. And we really, uh, just about every bomb I dropped, it, it was after consulting with him and making sure that we both agreed that this was safe to do. And, uh, you know, it, we were never informed of any, uh, any bombs we dropped that hurt civilians. I can't say that I'm certain that that was actually the case, but what I am pretty certain of is that if there were any civilians hurt, it was at least uh, uh, viewed by the locals there who saw it as, you know, part of the ongoing campaign and not anything gross on our part, you know, which is small consolation. But I still like to think that we did a we did a uh, as good a job as we could protecting everyone. Ari Holmes, the Netherlands Embassy. Um, I spent some months in uh, Tarinkal last year training the Afghan army, and I can guarantee you the people is, are still grateful for what you did. Um, my question is the following. On, on the one side, we're trying to build institutes like the Afghan army, Afghan national police, uh, governors, a government, uh, accountable, etc., etc. But it, it doesn't seem to work. Uh, and more and more, we hear the stories that, you know, uh, link up to the local power brokers, to the tribal leaders, uh, community defense initiatives, etc., etc. Are these things in contradiction? I, I'd like your perspective on that. Yes, sir. I, yeah, th this is th this is a tough one, as you saw, sir, and you, you know it better than I do at this point. Uh, but what I'll say is, uh, uh, th there there was a interesting dynamic. Uh, between Afghanistan and Iraq. Uh, when uh, Iraq was facing uh, the worst of, of its insurgency, civil war, whatever you want to call it, uh, a lot of us who'd fought in Afghanistan were asked for what lessons learned we could apply. And uh, what I had said at one point was, well, if you empower the local warlords with their local tribal forces, uh, that is a a uh, effective way from a certain perspective to gain control of an area, but it's the antithesis of central government. So what you're doing is you're empowering locals in this area, hey, they gain control, but you're not extending the reach of the central government. What you're doing instead is, you know, you're actually pushing the reach of the central government further away. Uh, but if you're in a situation where the central government doesn't have the power to reach out uh, yet and gain control, then to a degree, that's what you're left with. And uh, initially, uh, that view was met with a lot of skepticism because the view was, well, no, we need to empower the central government. We need to uh, you know, empower a central military to do those sorts of things. I, I think that it, it becomes a, uh, that protracted process that we all hate where you need a little bit of both. Uh, when you're looking at the uh, uh, furthest reaches of central government in Afghanistan, you know, they, uh, I, th I think they generally do know who's in power, contrary to what we hear. But if it's a warlord running the area, then we need to make a decision. If the central government isn't prepared to extend its reach yet, then maybe you do need local militias. And I mean militias that are aligned with the central government. They're providing uh, uh, military power in lieu of the central government until the central government can get out there. It's a awful uh, call to make because, as I say, you either have a warlord or you have central governance, and it's very hard to reconcile the two at a given time. Uh, but at the same time, it, it is a good technique if you want to establish control of an area. Early in Afghanistan, uh, uh, there was a big push uh, for Karzai to get rid of the warlords. And he began doing so, but then as things degenerated in Afghanistan, the warlords and their local armies have, have definitely become uh, a big question mark in, in terms of is there some utility here. I, I think, though, that 
in the long run, you absolutely need to get rid of the local militias. I, I personally think that in the long run, and we could be talking 40 years, but in the long run, you want to reach a point where you can uh, demobilize the militias uh, and you have a, a central government's army that's out there doing the work. But I, I don't know at what point we'll actually be ready to do that sort of thing. You know, I, I think that that's a, a long ways into the future. So, I mean, kind of returning to the basic issue, I think on the frontier where we're outside of government reach, there, there's a lot of utility and necessity in figuring out a way to uh, empower tribal militias, but you need to make sure that you do it in such a way that they're, they're still acting on behalf of the government, which is tough, as you know, over there. But ultimately, you do need to transition to a central army. I, I mean, I, I think that that's crucial. Any other questions? Hi, I'm Laura Iyama again. Um, I'm just curious, one of the um, things, I think when the British went into Afghanistan, they had lists of sort of tribal feuds so they could keep track of who's got what and going back how many generations. I understand there are still NGOs going to Afghanistan. They still consult with people. What are the tribal feuds? What are the, were you also taking that into account when you went into Afghanistan on your mission? Were there people who knew Afghanistan's history, knew the tribes and in some way told you, other than Karzai, um, people who would tell you, I, this is what you need to be aware of and watch out for? Yeah, no. We, we, uh, we knew very, very little. Uh, Ahmed Rashid's book, uh, Taliban, uh, was uh, the greatest insight I got into what was going on over there, and I'm reading it on the fly as we're, we're doing this. I mean, really, it, it was uh, uh, it was Karzai himself that provided us those insights. The, uh, the, 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 the biggest strength that we had going for us, though, was Karzai's Popolzai. He was considered... Uh, um, kind of blanket on the right word, but a, a, a senior tribal leader. Uh, so he was able to call on uh, uh, tribal loyalties uh, for two purposes, either for them to join us or for them to stay out of it. So we really were dealing with, uh, with, with several cases. Uh, uh, northeast of Terrancote, and uh, you, you tell me, sir, if, if this has changed, we were told stay away and they will leave us alone. I mean, it was basically this whole area of the map, they're not going to mess with us, we don't mess with them, focus elsewhere. Okay, got it. And then the other areas, it was a lot more straightforward. They're on our side, they're on their side. Uh, but there was always that neutral factor, and that was where a lot of the tribal affiliations allowed for those sorts of negotiations where you guys stay out of it, we're going south. Uh, and I think that often what happened, though, was you know they're going to stay out of it, uh, uh, to a certain point, wait to see what happened, and then after the fall of the Taliban, some of those neutral parties uh, might have joined us, others might have stayed neutral or even provided shelter to the Taliban. But it, it was really all through Karzai uh, that we were doing the negotiating. But as I say, because, uh, because there was a, a clear enemy side, it, it was you know the Taliban or us, <laughs> made it a lot easier for people to fall into one side or the other for us, and we didn't really have to worry about the tribal, uh, the, the, uh, tribal feuds that went on and tribal uh, affiliations and nuances. That is something Karzai was able to work for us, and, and he was a master at it. Great. Well, thank you very much, Eric Blum. Thank you very much, Major Amarine. Can we give a round of applause?